Now, from the Pope John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Welcome to the World Over Live. I'm Raymond Arroyo. We covered the 128th Supreme Convention of the Knights of Columbus this week. It happened right here in Washington, D.C. We'll be bringing you highlights as well as an interview with Supreme Knight Carl Anderson, Archbishop Timothy Dolan of New York, and Bishop Robert Baker of Birmingham. There are lots of great moments and memorable conversations to share with you. So let's dive right in. Here's my interview with Carl Anderson. He's the Supreme Knight of the Knights of Columbus. We talked to him about the theme of this year's Supreme Convention. Why was the theme, Our Brother's Keeper, I Am My Brother's Keeper, decided as the theme of this convention? Well, there was a question I wasn't expecting, really, well, but uh, well, it was well, just... Well, because, uh, I mean, when people think of the Knights, yeah. they often focus on the insurance program sure. or on the philanthropic uh, yeah. acts, uh, refurbishing a dome, cleaning the front of St. Peter's. They don't necessarily sure. think about your charitable work, which constitutes the majority of what you all do. Well, charity is the first principle. Okay. And I think uh, we've been reflecting more and more on Pope Benedict's first encyclical, Deus Caritas, as God is love. He makes this case very strongly. And I think we have to uh, continue to remind ourselves and remind our neighbors that it's not just social work. It's not just the government writing check, not just writing a check, but it's giving of ourselves to somebody in need. And not just that we help that person, but the bond, the bond between us, right? And so if uh, we are our brother's keeper, it's because we have a brother, as Archbishop Worrell said. And so we have to have this notion of brotherhood. And so it just, it just kind of uh, evolved out of more reflection on what Pope Benedict is calling us to do. And also, uh, we ask ourselves, what ought to really be the foundation for society? Mm -hmm. What ought to really be the glue that kind of binds us all right. together? Ought to be brotherhood. Mm -hmm. Ought to be brotherhood. And that, that comes out of the American experience, too, in the Knights of Columbus. Well, I, I like in your, in your report where you talked about not only the uh, financial contribution the Knights have made, but the, the, the time, the labor given, and putting a, a monetary value on that really kind of is shocking, the, the, the enormous amount of uh, energy and the personhood donated through the Knights. And that, that I thought was a really interesting, uh, you know, interesting addenda to your, your natural philanthropic activities. Let's talk for a moment about um, the various other activities. There's a focus at this convention on religious liberty, religious freedom, in a way that perhaps we haven't seen in the past. Why? Why now? And giving the Gaudium et Spes Award to uh, Cardinal Ortega of Cuba uh, sort of shines a, a bright light on this focus. Yeah. Well, it's, it's always been something very important to Knights of Columbus. We were very strong in the 20s in the U.S. when the, mm -hmm. the Ku Klux Klan was reemerging. Right. Uh, very strong in Mexico and the church was being persecuted. But looking at the globe today, it just seems that even though we have the fall of the Iron Curtain where we had all that institutionalized persecution, it still, it seems now that it's sort of open season on priests and bishops and others around the world. Uh, and you're reading more and more today about these kind of problems. And then on the other hand, you have real concerns with, say, national health care legislation. Yep. Are we going to respect rights of conscience? So it's time that I think we, we shine a brighter spotlight on what's going on and say, you know what? If we are our brother's keeper, then we can't do our job if we don't have freedom of conscience, if we don't have freedom of religion. Well, a lot of people probably don't realize, I didn't until fairly recently, that it was the Knights of Columbus who inserted the under God into the Pledge of Allegiance. And in recent years, you all have been fighting to keep it there. Uh, and you had some victories this year. Yes, we, we won in two Circuit Court of Appeals decisions. So uh, we feel pretty good about it. Uh, because we won, now the other side, the atheist side, if I could put it that way, they have to appeal. And uh, they have to appeal to the Supreme Court, but a tie on the court, you don't often get ties, but you might, uh, would uphold the 
ruling, so it would uphold the pledge. So we're in a little stronger position that we might have otherwise been, and it, I think it was important that we were involved as parties, so we helped in the argumentation of the case. You mentioned in your, in your address to the conference, your annual report, that a commitment to defend marriage, as well as religious liberty and charity, that this is all part of the thrust of the Knights. How will you defend marriage, especially as we see it being challenged on so many fronts, in the culture as well as legislatively? Well, those are the two places we have to be active. We have to be active in the culture and in legislation. So whether it's Proposition 8 in California or in the state legislatures, we have to make sure that the people have an opportunity for their voice to be heard. Because when their voice is heard, they're overwhelmingly in support of marriage, number one. Number two, we have to really give people a deep understanding of what marriage is about. It's not just a preference. It's not just that we were in a cafeteria and we got five or six different lifestyles, right? There is something in the very nature of man and woman that directs us to this institution. It is a special institution. It is a, it is a sign from the Creator as how man and women, men and women should be, how they should act. Mm -hmm. And so this spousal nature, what theologians would call the nuptial mystery, right. spousal concept of love is really what we should be using and understanding as our basic vocation and it should influence all that we do because at the heart of it nuptial love is self-giving right all right and it's so just what we talked about earlier it's, it is the root to, i mean it, it is a charitable act within itself it has its own it's that act of donation of self so i hope what this whole challenge results in is the fact that catholics reflect more deeply on the nature of marriage, the vocation of marriage, and how it is linked, its self-giving aspect, its gift of self aspect, makes it a, a connected with the priesthood and the religious life, because that also is a gift of self, and it arises from that same vocation of the human person, to love and to a nuptial kind of love. Before we run out of time, I want to talk about uh, some news that you made during this uh, annual report. You talked about the Knights in the tragedy in Haiti, mm -hmm. these children who don't have prosthetic limbs available to them mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of these companies simply don't make them. They make them for adults, but the children are growing so fast they sort of don't provide them. You all saw a need there. What are you going to do? Well, we began by saying, you know, maybe they need wheelchairs. So we're doing over 2,000 wheelchairs in Haiti uh, for women, men, children. But uh, that's only, you know, part of the answer. The other answer is to give them greater mobility. Mm -hmm. And when we look to the next step, we learned that the adults are pretty much taken care of because they can use refurbished right. uh, prosthetics. But nothing had been done for the children. So we said, okay, we're going to step up. How much is it? to do and uh, for the seven eight hundred children who lost arms and legs as a result of the earthquake there uh, we can do it for a little bit over a million dollars hmm. so we decided we're going to do it and get it done and change those kids lives hmm. and so next 18 to 24 months it'll be done because Fantastic of Knights work. of Columbus and and before I let you go this ultrasound project that you yeah. all began several yeah. years ago this is it seems to me a key um, initiative to not only take on this culture of death, but to do it yeah. on the very forefront, where it really makes a difference. It's not just a, a literature or a, or a talk. It, it, it truly can change this whole dynamic and this debate where it begins. Tell, tell us about the program. Well, it's, it's really a great program because our local councils, and we're matching their money, they raise the money, we split it 50-50, uh -huh. we buy the machine, we put it in a pregnancy, a crisis pregnancy center. Now, the important thing is it does more in 15 seconds of looking at your child through an ultrasound, then pages and pages of argumentation. It changes hearts. The woman sees it's her child. It's her child right there. And so eight out of 10 women who go in thinking, I'm gonna get an abortion, just tell me how to do it and where, look at this and then they say, it's my baby, I'm keeping him or I'm keeping her. And so we're changing hearts one at a time and then the other question is, how come the other side isn't telling the women this truth? How come it isn't informed? They talk a lot about choice. 
How about an informed choice? How about an informed choice so the woman knows what it is she has and what her real options are and that there are people out there that want to help her and will help her. Now, if they tell her that, what happens? She makes, the, she makes the, the choice for life. The choice for life. She makes it. The people who know her understand it's a good choice. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the reason why American public opinion, at least, has turned against abortion. We're a pro-life nation. Mm -hmm. uh, too bad there weren't enough in Congress the last few months ago remembering we're pro-life. Yep. Yep. And so... Uh, We'll see what happens. What do you want to tell this gathering next year that you could not tell them this year about the Knights or, or initiative or a plan that you, you have on the drawing board now? Well, I hope that our work for charity will grow. I hope that our defense and religious liberty will grow. And I hope that um, one of the things that we accomplish next year, maybe taking it another step forward, is a greater unity between Catholics in Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Mm -hmm and that we really begin to see that uh, this connectivity we have as Catholics stretches around the globe and that what unites us as Catholics sacramentally is so much more than anything that could divide us. Yeah, well, you certainly see it in this convention as you walk through the halls. Carl Anderson, thank, thank you for you. being here. Thank you very much. Pleasure. The Knights of Columbus Convention is always a great time to reconnect with old friends and friends of the program. Archbishop Timothy Dolan joined us this week to talk about some contemporary issues, some things on his mind, and his upcoming visit to Ireland. Take a look. I want to start, first of all, great to have you here in Good D.C. Good to be with you, For, Ray, for a brief it's moment. It's always a joy to so, see you and to be back with my friends in EWTN. Great to see you. Great Thank memories. You. Now, and you're, you're about to sit in with the, the great Father Benedict Rochelle again, I understand. I, uh, he wants me on the show. He tells me the ratings go up. Are you I'm all going on the road now with this we, thing? We might do a road show. Yeah, you know, I noticed. We're going to go to some nightclubs. Yeah, and that'll be good. You'll be playing the, the Indian casinos. It's going to be good. I love him. Let's talk, I like Indian casinos. <laughs> Let's talk about the Senate committee uh, this week codifying uh, President Obama's plan to wheel back, indeed, get rid of the Mexico City policy, which forbids U.S. foreign funds going toward any group that promotes or performs abortions. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on this? Very sad, very scared, and in a way, Raymond, I have to admit, a little embarrassed and disappointed. I was hoping and praying that maybe the caricature of President Obama as maybe at least trying to be abortion neutral my, and not that we ever want to be abortion neutral, we no. can't, but at least that's better than being pro-abortion. Yeah. That maybe that initial stance, that conciliatory stance of wanting to be abortion neutral, I was hoping that might uh, win. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, at least we're not going to have this radical advocate for expanding the abortion license. At, at least we're going to have somebody that has come out to say that he wants to be a source of unity and that he would be content to keep the status quo on abortion. I'm disappointed because I, I kind of believed them. Yeah. And I was hoping that that's what we had. And now uh, this, uh, and now with some of the, already with some of the, the, the hints that bill. we see with the health care, I'm yeah. thinking, oh, no, don't tell me. Don't tell me that those who, who told us that we had a radical promoter of abortion uh, and which I didn't want to listen to, are they right? I'm hoping not. But I have to admit, I'm scared, I'm disappointed, I'm very uh, worried. Mm -hmm. Let's talk also, a U.S. company was given permission this week to begin trials of human embryo research. See? And uh, this is down that same path. This is the seems. same path. It's all part of a package. It's all part of this, of, of, our, of the gospel of life. It's all part of the culture of death, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and and once, you, once, you, once you fudge, Raymond, that uh, life at any spectrum from, from the moment of conception to the moment of natural death, once you fudge that that can be tampered with, that can be played with, that can be experimented with, that can be discarded, we are really, you're not talking about a slippery slope, you're talking about some ski, uh, ski slope that, that you just take off. The, the one thing that gets me on this one, you know, sometimes our enemies, and Lord knows their name is Legion, will try to caricature us as being anti-science, right. especially when it comes to the to this issue of, of stem cells. Well, and all. But of course, say, I mean, not. But, but Archbishop, to, to make their argument, they would say they're giving permission to this company to use human embryos. These embryos are going to die anyway, they say. They're sitting there in a freezer. Let's use them for the benefit of mankind. 
and aren't you opposing possible scientific breakthroughs, indeed cures? You're standing in the way of you cures. You bet they say that, and, and in a way I would say, is it ever a tragedy and a horror that they're there to begin with? But now to use them is only going to solidify the position of those that think that human life is a commodity to be used, to be bought, to be sold, to selfishly improve, improve the lives of some. We can't go there. Yes, I'm with you saying what a tragedy and what a scandal that these human embryos are there to begin with. But, that's but a now to begin to that's that's wow. different. Now to begin to use them and to sell them and to experiment with them, what are we saying about ourselves? I thought we went through that in the thirties and forties yeah. in another part of the world. It's interesting how the church in recent weeks has come out. The Vatican is actually supporting efforts to uh, begin adult stem cell trials. They're actually financing sure. that research, which I, I think was an interesting sort of proactive yes, step by the Vatican. And, and getting there uh, uh, Benedict the 16th has been so splendid in what's called positive orthodoxy that he refuses to allow the church to be put into the corner of always saying no no he says no the church is about a big yes to life to God to faith to love uh, to the human project we got to say you, did you know now I've done some research on this Raymond you know I lived in Rome as rector of the North yeah. American College for many years next door is Bambino Gesù Hospital which is the premier pediatrics hospital in Italy that's where the, the beginning of research on stem cells happened. Not on embryonic cells, but on human, human cells, cells, all right? Yeah. So th once again, just like in the days back with, with, uh, with Mendel, the church is in the forefront of licit scientific research without compromising our respect and for the sanctity. And this is cord blood, uh, skin cells. Sure, this is a scrape. Let's scrape some uh, uh, some uh, cells off the back of your hand and see if perhaps some way scientifically we can duplicate those to be used for healing and therapy. This is not destroying uh, a, a, a living human, human embryo. embryo. There's and, a big difference, but don't, how dare people say that the Catholic Church is this nagging no-no to science and to an enlightened rational approach to things. No, we're on the forefront when it comes to legitimate, life-saving, life-giving science. And yet, Archbishop, in recent <coughs> days, you have been very critical of your own New York Times in your own diocese. It's not yours, but it's in your diocese. Um, and their take on the Church and their entire... Um, the way they've exploited, if you will, the recent sex abuse scandals around the world, and we have to be honest, just to make a journalistic point, many of these cases happened decades and decades, in some cases 50 years ago, mm -hmm. and yet they're being thrown onto the front pages as if they happened last sure. Wednesday. Sure. Your thoughts on all of this, is, do you see an anti-Catholicism at play here, or is that going too far? No, I, I do see an anti-Catholicism. Now, I gotta say right off the bat, the church needs the church expects and the church welcomes scrutiny and criticism. As long as that scrutiny and criticism is fair and balanced and civilly expressed, that hasn't happened. So I would look back, Raymond, over the last 10 years, I think in some ways one can say, thanks be to God that press took a searchlight and looked at the church's handling of this tragedy of the sexual abuse of minors. Fair enough, thanks be to God, they discovered the problem, I think we've reacted uh, in all propriety and in a very rigorous, acceptable way. What isn't, what, it, what, what is not fair is if, first of all, they single out the church as the only one guilty of this. Secondly, they dig up old news that is well taken care of from decades ago to give the impression that it's something new. And thirdly, when they totally ignore the real news story, namely the fact that nobody nowhere is doing it better now in responding to the societal, cultural horror of the sexual abuse of minors than the Catholic Church, especially in the United States. That's what's unfair. If you're going to criticize, do it. I welcome it. I, I need it. Believe me, we're not above it. Uh, but do it fairly, do it objectively, and do it in a civil way. That's where the failures come and in. And in some context, let's put it side by side sure, with abuse sure. in when you've got or... When you've got, uh, you know, that uh, something from 40 years ago about the abuse, of, the tragic abuse of a child by a, a priest is front page, day after day after day after day, and the huge problem of sexual abuse of students in public schools is never mentioned at all, even though it's well documented, you're, you're beginning to wonder, is there an agenda here? And I'm afraid there is. 
Uh, Archbishop Dolan, you were not yet uh, in the mix when the church first encountered this. You were still, I think, the rector 10 years ago when this first happened. Yes, yeah, I know, Raymond. Oh, I came home in 2001. Okay. Uh, and then, yes, I was ordained in 2001. Right. You remember literally all hell broke loose yeah. on the Feast of the Epiphany, yeah. January 6, 2002, when That's the Boston right. Globe re re began its, its coverage. By that time, I was auxiliary well, bishop auxiliary in St. Louis, Louis and vicar for clergy. Oh, so, terrible time. Well, yeah. you, but you had a front row seat then to what was happening, and now you've been appointed to, on behalf of the Vatican, begin a visitation in uh, Ireland. Uh -huh. Tell me what lessons you hope to impart to the Irish who are just struggling with this, particularly the, the, the bishops, whom I don't think have our experience necessarily, having gone through 10 years of this, uh -huh. or seen, uh, I was just in England, and one of your confreres is going to be joining you on this, on this uh, visitation. I was sharing some information from the John Jay Report and other things. First, they'd heard of it. Yeah. yeah. What are you going to tell them? I think you're on to something. Now, we got to be careful about saying that because yeah. we don't want to come across as know-it-alls right. or like we're, we're these, uh, you know, these fancy Americans coming over yeah. with all our experience because Lord knows the Church of Ireland has more wisdom than, uh, than we'll ever have uh, with, with her long, long and glorious history. But on the other hand, you're right. In the school of hard knocks, the last decade, have we ever paid our tuition? Yeah. And maybe we're able to impart some of this. A couple things, Raymond, I would hope to do. First of all, seek ye first the kingdom of God. So I'm hoping that what I can, what I can share with the seminaries, with my brother bishops, is that this has to be a cause of spiritual renewal. This has got to be a return uh, to integrity, to fidelity, to holiness of life. That's number one. And that let's look upon this as an, as an occasion of the upside of the Paschal Mystery. A lot of dying. Let's try to begin the rising. Secondly, uh, I, I, that, that we need to, re, to perhaps, let's make some lemonade out of lemons here. And let's the lemonade be a real, genuine renewal in the noble cause of priestly formation. Let's see that our students are, are farmed uh, from a human point of view, to be very mature, to be very responsible, to be very uh, uh, con uh, just well versed in in their own humanity, in their the need for virtue, in the need for education, in their own interior peace, with the lifelong call to chastity and celibacy. Let's make sure that's there academically. Let's make sure that they are totally uh, integrated in the teachings of the church. And apostolically, let's make sure that they're men of zeal and love who can impart that to others. Now, boy, is that ever a big That's prescription. A yeah, and there's no, there's no book out there, Raymond, where yeah. it's going to show you how to do that. But at least can we make sure that we've got the essentials in order and that the basics are covered? Because the bishops of Ireland, God bless them, like the bishops in the United States, have given their word to their good people that we will do our best to make sure this doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. And part of that means that we only ordain men who are reliable, responsible, healthy, holy, humble guys. How do you screen <coughs> and do you support screening candidates for the priesthood who might have a homosexual disposition or have, have in the past uh, had homosexual encounters and that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, there's no, you were starting to ask about how do you screen, I think, yeah. for this, because yeah. I wish there were, there was a you know, some blood pressure test yeah. that you can take to say, uh-oh, yeah. this guy has a little tendency maybe to have some yeah. real perverted uh, uh, sexual yeah. attraction to, uh, to minors. <laughs> if there were such a test, wow, would we ever be in the forefront of, of using it? <clears throat> but there isn't. Mm -hmm. We have learned that there are certain things you can look for, that we have learned that there are certain hints that the psychological sciences give us. We have learned that there are certain things that you can look for in the careful scrutiny that you need to give candidates when they are in apostolic situations. Mm -hmm. Forever, if, for instance, you see a guy that's by himself too much, you see a guy who is uncomfortable around his peers and seems to, to only want to deal with those who are much younger with him. Mm -hmm. uh, you see a guy that might tend to narcissism mm -hmm. and an irresponsible style of life who, who seems to lack discipline in, in simple areas like the ability to give, get up on time and mm -hmm. keep appointments and return calls. Those are danger signals, Raymond. Those are flares. John Paul II was great in saying, grace builds upon nature. We better make sure that the nature of the guy that we got is docile and subtle and able to take the grace of holy orders. And if we don't have, the Italians have a great phrase, you can only make gnocchi with the dough you got. If you don't have the dough there, 
that is going to be a, 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 a receptacle of God's grace, well, then we need to, to say, move on. Uh -huh. Let's do yourself and the church a favor to say, move on. Are those things, are those things in place? I hope so. I'd like to think they are. Uh, and that's, I guess, what I'm going to try to help my brother bishops and, uh, and collaborators in, in priestly formation make sure that they are. Certainly a huge task, and we wish you well on that. Thanks. You David. recently came uh. out with a book called Doers of the Word. <laughs> that and was the easiest it, book I ever put out. It was just a compilation of, of it, columns that I had in the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. And it's little, but it's little, it's little reflections, it's uh, uh, prayers. No uh, pictures if you're looking no, for No, I'm them, looking right? for the pictures. I'm waiting. Is that going to come out later as a coffee table edition? With, I hope with recipes. There's a wonderful line in here. Uh, you, you say in here that you wrote half of this in your chapel in Milwaukee the other half oh, in, your, yeah. in your New York yeah, chapel. Uh, one quiet and peaceful, the yeah. other a bit louder. Yes, a little louder. Um, how, do you, how do you find God in that cacophonous city that you now occupy? It is not a quiet place. And if God is best sought in quiet, uh -huh. how do you find Him in well, the middle of the city you, on Madison you, Avenue? You got it. You have got to. There's always, you know, in our Catholic, in the Catholic genius, there's always the transcendent and there's always the incarnational. The transcendent is, of course, you can, one can only find God in quiet, in tranquility, and you got to make sure you get that. Okay, so I'm literally Raymond. If that means earplugs, that means earplugs, because <laughs> there's got to be some quiet. But we also find God in the incarnational, which means in the flesh and blood reality of God's people, God's church. New York has that in spades, okay? So, yeah. so I'm able, the incarnational dimension of, of the Catholic genius, that's really present in, uh, in, uh, in New York. So you need both, don't you? And, yeah. and you find it. The, the book yeah. is fantastic Thanks. for those who, do, who haven't got a doers of the word. It's really an interesting read. You are also, for, on behalf of the bishops, leading Catholic relief services uh, yeah, as, the, as yeah. the bishop representative. Uh, you've been going down to Haiti a lot, and I noticed I'm some of these other again, hot spots. Yeah. Tell me what you've seen down there. Haiti is, you know, a word I, I would use, and pardon if it's uh, bromide, but I'd use the word bittersweet. So there's still a lot of bitterness. Part of the bitterness is the terribly, you're talking about a glacial pace of rebuilding. As you know, whenever it comes to, oh. to work like Catholic Relief Services, we talk about relief and we talk about rebuilding. Yep. Good news, Raymond, the sweet part of the bitterness comes in that relief is gone pretty good. All right. So the food, the temporary shelter, the clean water, the medical care, the clothing, that, thanks to the sacrificial generosity of so many people, that is going rather well. Rebuilding is the bitter part. doesn't seem to be happening. We need to count our blessings. There hasn't been violence. Mm -hmm. There has not been any epidemics. You know, most of the time after a huge ca uh, catastrophe. Without water. Yeah, and I think that's because the relief is going so well. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do about the rebuilding? I, I noticed recently, though, that uh, that the Archbishop of Miami, Thomas Winsky, and the Bishop of Brooklyn, uh, Nicholas de Marzio, were down there, and they said, you know, I know we got we have to have patience. Look at the, the look at 9/11 site, mm. still not rebuilt. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, we're still doing rebuilding after Katrina. the tsunami, yep. Katrina. Okay. In Haiti, it's even slower. We don't have the infrastructure there. Okay. Yeah. At least here, we got a government to criticize for not doing anything. <laughs> they don't have it there. Yeah. All right. So, it, bittersweet, I guess, yeah. is the best word. We can't forget about it. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. the Knights announced this week that they're going to be providing prosthetic legs for children wow. who uh, simply don't have them yeah. because I guess they don't I make... I met some fellow out here on the floor. Did you see him that had um, uh, wheelchairs, that they were yes. bringing wheelchairs yeah. down there? So they really wow. are doing their, their yeah. part. But, but the, the, this focus on rebuilding the infrastructure, that's such a long-term yeah. project. And uh, what is Catholic Relief Services' role in that part of the, the rebuilding? Are, they, are you all working with the local church to propose plans. We are, and of course the local church has been decimated right. too, right? Thanks be to God. Caritas International, which is the Holy Sees mm -hmm. kind of choreography that it gives to international relief and rebuilding, has asked Catholic Relief Services to take a leadership role in Haiti, and we're trying our best. Lord knows we got our hands full with just the relief. But without the churches, uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, not long ago I met with uh, Bill Clinton, of all people, and he gave a great compliment to the church. He said, boy, without the church down there, you think it's bad now, we'd be a lot worse off. And he said that the church is where the people are, see? So they're, they're there. They know the blocks. They know the neighborhoods. They, need the people who, they, they, they knew the people who were missing. Uh, so that, the Catholic Relief Services is, is doing its best. Good thing, Raymond, we've been there 60 years, Catholic Relief Services. We're not some do-gooders who parachute in. Right. Uh, I, I, when, when I say we, I mean you. I mean Catholics right. in the United States through CRS, Catholic mm -hmm. Relief Services. We've been in Haiti for 60 years, all right, and it'll be there for 
60 more. So we were on the ground, all right, when it happened. Everybody else who parachuted in, including the American government, said, uh, what road goes there? Or uh, how do we get trucks for there? Or, boy, who would be good on rebuilding this runway? Guess what? CRS knew because we're there. You live there. So, yeah. Fascinating. I want to talk about something closer to your diocese before I let you go. There has been this ongoing controversy about building this Islamic center, oh. this mosque oh at my. Ground you know, Zero. I had another appointment. Do you, <laughs> do, you, do you support the building of the mosque at Ground Zero? Uh, can I, I'm not going to try to dodge your question, no. and I will answer it. And if okay. I don't, you pin me down. Okay. What we've really got is a balance of interests here, don't we? On the one hand, there's the high interest of religious freedom and energetic hospitality that has made America great. All right, That is a tremendous interest that must be protected. On the other hand, we've also got a legitimate interest to self-protection that is very legitimate. And I hear thoughtful voices on both sides that I sort of say, you got a point, you got a point. Even on the side of without a mosque, they'll say, you know, we're not anti-Islamic here, we're all for religious freedom. We're just worried that there's still questions about some of these groups that are causing us to say, uh-oh, should we, are we moving too quickly and should we make sure that they're not going to be a danger to us? And we also have a sensitivity to the fact that uh, a lot of people died a block away because of the, of the violent extreme of the religion that will now be represented here. And then on the other side, I hear thoughtful voices say, but what about hospitality? What about religious freedom? Somewhere between the two, Raymond, we probably need to, uh, uh, to go. And I'm very proud of our mayor. Our mayor, his, Mayor Bloomberg, has stood up and said, darn it, we're Americans. I know there could be a downside here, but I'm, I'm, for, this, I'm for this mosque. Another thoughtful voice recently, um, Abe, uh, Abe Foxman with yep. the uh, Anti-Defamation yep. League has said, we are for religious freedom, we're for hospitality. Perhaps if we could relook at it and have the mosque situated not so close to 9-11, it might be much more acceptable. Zero, yeah. That could be that could be a, a serene answer. Uh, yeah. answer. Bill McGurn had an interesting piece in the Wall Street Journal, and he wrote that John Paul II, may have an answer for us in this situation. And he referred to, you remember, the Carmelite the sisters I, in Auschwitz. I didn't see the article, but it makes sense, yeah, does it? Yeah, there, there was that, the convent, the Carmelite sisters had been there. It was a great controversy. There was no problem. They were praying for the souls there. They were yeah. praying for, for, for peace in the region. They were just interceding, not doing anything. But the Jewish families who, who, whose parents died there felt, it you know what, this is, it yeah. rubbed them raw, this is our sacred ground, yeah. and John Paul asked the Who's sisters, the one that said, please sisters, leave, without conceding yeah. anything. I like that. I had not thought of the analogy, and, and, but our uh, friend Bill McGurn might be on yeah, something Yeah, I there. think he's uh -huh. on something there. So, and that actually is what Abraham, maybe that's where Abe got it. Uh, maybe. Uh, from John Paul. with the. So with, you haven't come down one way or the I other. I have not come down, and I, but I, I think that could present a good compromise. I have tried to kind of listen to both sides, because I think, again, not that I shy away from controversy, mm -hmm. as you well know, I oh, don't. Oh, no, I know. But I'm thinking, darn it, a bishop is supposed to be a pontiff, a bridge builder, right. and, and maybe I can kind of encourage what's best in both sides to come to some type of, of, uh, of an agreement, and maybe this is the way out. God bless Bill. When we return, more World Over highlights from the 128th Supreme Convention of the Knights of Columbus. We'll bring you Cardinal Jaime Ortega's speech, the Cardinal of Havana. He was awarded a special honor by the Knights and had a moving speech. We'll share that with you and our interview with Bishop Robert Baker when the World Over Live continues. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live, our special coverage of the 128th Supreme Convention of the Knights of Columbus has concluded, but we have some highlights for you. This is Cardinal Jaime Ortega. He is the Cardinal of Havana. Many of you will remember the historic visit of Pope John Paul II in 1998. Many things have changed on this island nation since that visit for the better due in no small part to the work of Cardinal Ortega. Take a look, here he is accepting his Gaudium et Spes award given to him by the Knights of Columbus for his outstanding service to the church. The church has always been duly interested 
in a discreet, direct, and non-violent way in everything related to justice and the common good. It has succeeded in having its publications read and appreciated not only by practicing Catholics, but also by others, since they reflect the lacks and expectations of many Cubans. Lately, the Cuban government, responding to our request, has asked us to mediate between the political prisoners' relatives and the government authorities in order to know their proposals. In this way, a process began which has led to the recent announcement that 52 convicts considered prisoners of conscience by Amnesty International will be released in a period of three to four months. More than 20 of these prisoners have already traveled to Spain. These discussions conducted by the church have been unprecedented and they bring about a new situation of social appreciation for our Catholics. We hope that this process of dialogue in which we are immersed now ends successfully. We ask you to pray for this cause and for our church in Cuba. Recently, the spokesman of the Holy See, Father Lombardi, acknowledging our church mediation has said, and I quote, the crucial role in the process of dialogue assumed by Cardinal Ortega and by Archbishop Dionisio Garcia, President of the Bishops' Conference, was made possible by the evident fact that the Catholic Church is deeply rooted among the people and, needs, and is a reliable interpreter of its spirit and expectations. The church, he observed, is not an extrinsic reality. She does not flee in difficult times. She bears sufferings and hopes with dignity and with patience, without servility, but also without trying to increase tensions and excite souls. On the other hand, she does so with the continuous effort to open roads to understanding and to dialogue. End of the quote. I sincerely believe this is also what the Knights of Columbus acknowledged by bestowing this undeserved award upon me. I am deeply honored. On behalf of my church in Cuba, I reiterate my deepest gratitude to the Supreme Knight and to all the Knights of Columbus. I pray the Lord that he continues to bless your ecclesiastic actions and that Father Michael McGivney, who was inspired by God to found this extraordinary ecclesiastic work, may soon be canonized. I bless you all and pray for you all. Thank you very much. During our time at the Supreme Convention, we ran across Bishop Robert Baker, the Bishop of Birmingham, and we asked him why so many bishops attend this convention. There were more than eight cardinals and 84 bishops here. Here's what Bishop Baker had to say. Bishop Baker, thank you for being with us. Well, uh, it's you. great to see you here at a Knights of Columbus convention. Now, why do so many bishops come? to these conventions? I mean, 80 bishops, 84 bishops coming to this dinner, uh, the state's dinner the other night. Uh, how do you explain this? Well, I can say why I'm here, just basically to say thanks to the Knights of Columbus for all they've done for me over the years, starting, Raymond, way back when I was uh, in grade school in really? Prostoria, Ohio. I lived on Center Street, and right across the street was the Knights of Columbus Hall. And the Knights uh, were great. They uh, allowed us to play football in their front yard. Uh, we tore up their grass and they didn't complain. And uh, <clears throat> also, they sponsored the Boy Scout Troop 450. So early on, I had great admiration for them. My dad was a member. 
and then uh, later I, I was, when I was ordained a priest in 1970, right away uh, they recruited me and they pushed you know, the priest right through all three degrees like in <laughs> five minutes, you know. That's right. So uh, uh, then we had that long-standing relationship with that relationship as priest and, and members of the Knights, uh, Knights of Columbus. And uh, then when I became a bishop in Charleston, South Carolina, the, the Knights would drive me all through the state. I would uh, rely on them, especially two of them, to uh, be my chauffeurs, as it were, to yep. different events. When I was um, doing confirmations up and down this, the uh, coast wow. of, of South Carolina, normally they would drive me. That's good. And um, then now uh, in Birmingham, same thing. Um, there was a night, Skip Gentle, who was driving me not long ago. Big storm hit Birmingham, and he just got a new car. And uh, the the um, they were getting hail. Hail was coming down in his on his new car, and I was fearful that we were going to have a broken wind, windshield. We didn't, but that's the kind of thing they would do to help their bishop out. Mm -hmm. So, a uh, lot of different types of services to the church, and yeah. so we bishops are very indebted. Yeah, to people them. focus on, and we we've been focusing on the philanthropic efforts of the church, uh, or, or the knights rather, but they do a great deal of service within the church, and certainly at the past of the bishop. Exactly. All the bishop has to do is say, I need help, and you'll have ten knights calling you. How can we help you? Mm -hmm. And it's been that way. And especially, I think, uh, let's say, uh, the morale part, when the church has been attacked and uh, mm -hmm. under fire for many reasons, sometimes good reasons, but uh, the criticism has been heavy. Uh, we bishops feel vulnerable sometimes when we're out there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's kind of like a phalanx of, of knights uh, with you. And uh, you know that you're, you know, not only uh, spiritually supported, but right. physically protected. Yeah, Sometimes you need, you need helpful. that help. That's helpful. So how are things back in Birmingham? Well, you have to come back and visit sometime. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm coming soon. Great. Well, I think go and find them. I'm there three years, Raymond. You introduced me, welcomed me when I came there three years ago. And uh, it's been a, a wonderful venture. And, of course, I'm, I have the opportunity of being close to EW10. I only live about uh, ten minutes away. Mm -hmm. So when <clears throat> there's a special need I have coming up, the, uh, the uh, friars will be doing their professions, a oh. couple of final professions for the, 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 the friars, and I'll be doing those for them. And, and I'm very impressed with those young men who are part of the daily uh, service to EW10 with uh, liturgies, with the mass, with okay. prayers, and doing other things. So it's been a good relationship yeah. overall. Yeah. So I've been well, very, I know they're happy grateful. to have you. So I've been honored. And we're happy to have you as well. Raymond, Thank it's you it's so a much joy. for being God here bless you. and for all you do. Thank, Thank you. you God bless you. As we conclude, we leave you with a highlight of the annual report of the Supreme Knight of the Knights of Columbus, Carl Anderson. Here's that report. The vast majority of Knights of Columbus activity is directed toward matters of faith, charity, and family life. We are not a political organization, and partisan politics is expressly prohibited by the terms of our Constitution and laws. Our members include people of many political persuasions, and our goal is unity in faith and fraternity, whatever our political differences might be. But we do take positions on a limited number of key issues that we believe are fundamental to faithful Catholic citizens and which involve matters that must transcend partisan politics. Our guide in this area are two of the great documents of the Second Vatican Council, Gaudium et Spes, which address the role of the church in the modern world, and Dignitatis Humanae, its teaching on religious freedom and the fundamental dignity of every person. Recently, Pope Benedict, announced that the theme of next year's World Day of Prayer for Peace will be religious freedom, the path to peace. Recalling the message he delivered before the United Nations General Assembly two years ago, he reminded us that human rights must include the right to religious freedom, which is guaranteed by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is inconceivable, the Holy Father said, that believers should have to suppress a part of themselves, their faith, in order to be active citizens. It should never be necessary, he said, to deny God in order to enjoy one's rights. 
In some parts of the world today, Christians are targeted precisely on account of their faith. But even in countries where the free exercise of religion and freedom of conscience are protected in law, medical professionals and others too often find their rights violated. As Pope Benedict said in his statement last month, the rights associated with religion are all the more in need of protection if they are considered to clash with a prevailing secular ideology. The defense of religious liberty has been a top priority of the Knights of Columbus since our founding, and we will continue to defend this fundamental right. In 1954, the U.S. Congress voted at our urging to put the words under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. But in recent years, these words have been challenged in federal courts. Beginning in 2005, we asked these courts to allow us to participate directly in these cases as defendant interveners. And I'm happy to be able to report to you that during the past year, we have won victories in two of these cases, in California and New Hampshire, where courts affirm the constitutionality of the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Appeals are now pending in both the First and the Ninth Circuit Courts of Appeal, and we will continue to defend the pledge and the words under God all the way to the Supreme Court if necessary. <laughs> Laws protecting the institution of marriage are also a top priority for us. In all of these areas, we are consistent with Catholic teaching, and we devote no small amount of our time and resources to advancing our position in the public square. Since last year's convention in Phoenix, our brother knights in Maine played an important role in winning passage of a referendum that overturned legislation legalizing same-sex marriage in that state. And as was the case in California one year earlier, knights made an important difference in the successful defense of marriage. In the United States, judges have forced same-sex marriage on the people of Massachusetts, Connecticut, and Iowa. And earlier, Canadian courts had done the same thing in a majority of provinces. But where the people themselves have had a chance to vote, clear majorities have voted to protect traditional marriage in every single case. We stand ready to work hand in hand with the Catholic Church to safeguard marriage. We are directly supporting the U.S. Bishops Committee for the Defense of Marriage, chaired by Archbishop Joseph Kurtz. The committee is producing pastoral materials on the meaning of marriage. The new initiative, Marriage, Unique for a Reason, is designed to help Catholics everywhere understand and articulate why marriage is and can only be the union of one man and one woman. I encourage every council to work with our pastors and our chaplains to ensure that millions of Catholics have an opportunity to view the committee's first video on marriage entitled, Made for Each Other. Recently, we launched an initiative to save the lives of thousands of unborn children one by one. Every day, Thousands of women are making individual decisions to have an abortion under great pressure, and often with little knowledge about the precious new human life within them. But modern ultrasound technology now provides clear, well-defined, full-color images of the child in the womb, and the opportunity to see these images and to understand in detail the development of a child, even in the early weeks of pregnancy, often has a dramatic effect on a woman's decision. In our ultrasound program, the Supreme Council provides a matching grant 
for every state and local council that raises half the cost of a new ultrasound machine. And since the beginning of the program in Iowa, Georgia, and Florida 19 months ago, Knights in 25 states have enabled the purchase of 53 ultrasound machines. Together so far, we have donated $1,627,000 to buy these machines, and it is the single largest and most important project funded by our Culture of Life Fund. From Jacksonville to Cincinnati, from Baton Rouge to Los Angeles, from Boise to Dallas, these new Knights of Columbus supplied ultrasound machines are saving the lives of unborn children each and every day. Slowly but surely, our work and that of so many others in the pro-life movement is building a culture of life and is changing hearts and minds. Our Marist College, Knights of Columbus poll, was the first, the first to measure a strong surge in pro-life sentiment in the United States several years ago. Since then, the Gallup poll and other surveys have confirmed that there is now a new pro-life majority in America. Gallup poll... <laughs> Gallup poll calls it the new normal. And we must now accelerate that trend build momentum, and construct a new culture of life. Still, there are those who insist that we must accept Roe v. Wade as settled law. But on this question, we agree with Abraham Lincoln. He said this, the candid citizen must confess that if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed, by decisions of the Supreme Court the instant they are made in ordinary litigation, the people will have ceased to be their own rulers, having to that extent practically resigned their government into the hands of the judiciary. Abraham Lincoln could not accept the Supreme Court's decision in the Dred Scott case and that it had settled the issue of slavery. And we cannot accept that Roe v. Wade has settled the issue of abortion. <laughs> As we go about this work, we must always remember that we want to persuade not alienate those who feel differently. As St. Paul wrote in his letter to the Galatians, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he continued, but if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you are not consumed by one another. Well, that concludes our coverage. Until next week, you can find updates and occasional commentary by following me on Twitter at twitter.com slash Raymond Arroyo or on my Facebook fan page. Those of you who follow me get not only show previews, but additional material by our guests. And you can always find me at RaymondArroyo.com. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. We'll see you next time. We'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. Bye now. Thank you.